gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Mr. Andreas Bummel, a renowned figure in the field of global governance and democracy. As the founder and executive director of Democracy Without Border, Mr. Bummel has earned global recognition as a leading expert and advocate for a world parliament. His tireless dedication has garnered support from over 1,500 parliamentarians, spanning more than 100 countries for the for a, a parliamentary assembly at the United Nations. In 2021, he assumed the role of co-convener for the We the People campaign, a movement dedicated to advancing democracy within the UN. And this campaign has united over 200 organizations worldwide, including prominent environmental and civil rights NGOs. Mr. Bommel is also a valuable member of the advisory board of the World Government Research Network, contributing his expertise to advance the study and understanding of global government. Between 1998 and 2008, he served as uh, on the Council of the World Federalist Movement, a pivotal force in championing the creation of the International Criminal Court. In 2018, he co-authored the influential book, uh, World Parliament, Governance and Democracy in the 21st Century, a seminal work that sheds light on the history and implementation of world parliaments. We are privileged to have Mr. Bowman with us today, and we eagerly anticipate the insights and wisdom he will share based on his remarkable work. And Mr. Bowman, I give the word to you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matteo, for this kind introduction and for the invitation to speak at this very interesting seminar on structural change. I was um, asked to address um, the issue of structural change from the perspective of my specific work on the creation of a UN Parliamentary Assembly. So in the course of the next 30 to 40 minutes, I intend to address um, some broader areas. First, so we know what we are speaking about, what is actually the concept of the UN Parliamentary Assembly. Then as the next broader section, um, why uh, is it necessary to promote UN Parliamentary Assembly from the perspective of potential structural change? This includes um, thoughts on, on the strategy of achieving global structural change. And the third and, and final element of what I want to address is really, where are we now in, in the efforts of broader global transformation in general, but um, in creating a UN parliamentary assembly more specifically. So let's then address the first um, item. What is a UN parliamentary assembly? I believe the easiest way to understand this concept is to look at it as a process that begins in a pragmatic way and develops towards a more bold vision of a world parliament, actually. So if we look at the beginning of this process, that would have successive stages that we cannot necessarily identify exactly at this point. At the beginning, the idea is that the United Nations General Assembly would create by a majority decision which is possible through Article 22 of the UN Charter, a subsidiary parliamentary body, so to speak, as an advisory and consultative entity that includes elected representatives as opposed to government representatives who we have in the General Assembly. So it would be a complementary body at the beginning with primarily consultative functions. The um, UN Parliamentary Assembly could um, shadow the committees of the UN General Assembly, depending on how it is being designed. Um, but we think um, that the Parliamentary Assembly should have some leeway in organizing its work. So in, in practice, um, it would set up committees and subcommittees on the issues 
the representatives in the assembly find most pertinent. And I mean, there are some obvious topics that require um, global solutions, and one of which is climate change. So I would assume that if a parliamentary assembly were established, the, the representatives would decide um, that they establish a committee on climate change or climate change mitigation. Mm -hmm. and, and this committee then would be able to, to shadow UN work in this field and even going beyond the UN, right? Um, so um, this is important because the, the, the practical work of the parliamentary assembly would not necessarily only be done in the plenary, you know, the um, meeting of all representatives, but in subgroups. And um, further, it is important, as opposed to the UN General Assembly, to understand that at least as we um, advocate a parliamentary assembly, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be country delegates in the parliamentary assembly and not even geopolitical groups um, based on geographic and, and regional, um, um, you know, origin. Uh, but instead, uh, the delegates or representatives would be required to group in, you know, according to their political um, understanding in, in their own transnational um, groups, which means we would end up probably having, you know, representatives from different countries being part of a, let's say, conservative group or of an environmental green group, a socialist group, etc. So uh, it is easy to imagine many such groups um, coming up in the assembly that transcend national boundaries. And that is, that is the key point um, of the parliamentary assembly, because we expect that this would create a complete different dynamism as opposed to what we can see in intergovernmental negotiations um, or in, in the typical UN bodies like the General Assembly. And in particular, um, the, the point is here also that the broad pers political perspectives that exist, at least in, in democratic countries, would be better represented. At this time, the UN um, is composed, as, as we know, of member states, and they are represented through the executive branch of the government, and and that does you know that does not reflect necessarily the complex political complexity that exists in single countries, like through one diplomat and one government speaking. Um, so what that is more or less a, a brief response to the question: um, What is a UNPA? Um, but like I said at the beginning, we have to look at it as a process, which means initially the representatives for pragmatic and tactical reasons um, would probably mostly um, be chosen from within political groups in national parliaments, which means national parliamentarians would essentially make up the membership of the UN Parliamentary Assembly. However, it is suggested that countries can opt to have their delegates, their representatives, directly elected. So I can foresee a successive process of the UN Parliamentary Assembly initially being composed of national parliamentarians and as countries, more and more countries opt to have their delegates directly elected, we would end up having, you know, a hybrid body with national parliamentarians and directly elected parliamentarians. And, and this body over time, and that is also the intention, um, would move into the direction of uh, an actual parliament, um, whose the members of which are by majority vote, you know, directly elected. And, and the, the, the end point in, in that development would be a world parliament um, that is directly elected by the world's population um, everywhere, right? I mean, of course, uh, the question is when can such an endpoint be reached, but that is in the process, um, the idea, the, the vision behind it. And um, at the same time, as democratic legitimacy of the body grows, as directly more and more delegates are directly elected, I mean, obviously, there's a connection, 
in terms of legitimacy to the election procedure. Um, so as more and more legitimacy um, would be built up through direct, more and more direct elections, the body could also um, be vested with more and more powers, right? So as I said at the beginning, the parliamentary assembly is envisioned to be a consultative body. However, um, it would then go into the direction of acquiring real um, decision-making power. Yeah. And that does not only um, that does not only affect the you know the vision of of binding world law, of which I will speak a bit more later. Um, but even at the initial stage, where the parliamentary assembly is created as a subsidiary body of a general assembly, um, the general assembly can actually vest the parliamentary assembly with noticeable uh, powers. Um, in, a, in a procedural way. For instance, the General Assembly could self-impose on itself, you know, a rule saying it will only, it will only confirm a Secretary General of the UN um, if before that the candidate has also been confirmed by the Parliamentary Assembly. So there's nothing legally that could stop the General Assembly from doing that, or even the UN budget. Um, of course, the budgetary power at the UN by the UN Charter is vested in the General Assembly, but the General Assembly could procedurally say they will only approve of a budget that before that has been approved by a parliamentary assembly. I'm not saying this is necessarily at the beginning the um, goal. I'm just trying to open up um, our imagination as to what the parliamentary assembly actually could do below even below the threshold of charter reform as we know the reform of the un charter is a very difficult undertaking because it is subject um, amongst other things like two-thirds majority of a general assembly um, primarily a subject of a veto of the permanent five members of the security council which according to the relevant articles 108 and 109 of the Charter, I have to agree to any Charter amendment, which is, you know, the reason why very few amendments have ever been made. At least um, no amendments of, of real legal and political significance. So that is the idea of... Um, what a UN parliamentary is. It's more complex, but I think that gives us a good um, initial picture. And now the question is, why? Why would we pursue the idea of a UN parliamentary assembly, really? And in this case, we are pursuing, we, but this is the campaign for UN parliamentary assembly and Democracy Without Borders, my organization, the World Federalist Movement, and others. So, so we are pursuing this as part of a larger strategy to achieve global transformational change. And I believe that is why the topic is also relevant in connection um, with your consideration in the seminar of um, structural change, of course. And I can briefly outline what this World Federalist Strategy is. So maybe we start also with the long-term vision behind it that has been around for a long time, you know, particularly after the Second World War in the years after 1945, there was a large momentum for the idea of what it was called at the time, world government. And that was not only because of the devastation of the Second World War, but also because of the catastrophic, um, you know, bombardment with nuclear weapons of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the realization that the development of nuclear weapons really changes interstate relationships and the whole dynamics of power politics globally and potential great power conflict. And obviously that's because with nuclear powers, uh, with nuclear arms, any confrontation between the nuclear arms 
powers is potentially a suicide and might lead to a um, nuclear holocaust, Armageddon, so to speak. And based on, on this realization, nuclear scientists like Albert Einstein and others, Robert Oppenheimer, um, they argued that nuclear technology and nuclear relevant resources need to be put under the control of a global authority that actually um, goes beyond you know, and supersedes national sovereignty. And of course, today we have many issues um, that have to be dealt with. It's not only peace and security anymore or nuclear disarmament and control of nuclear weapons, but many other, um, unfortunately, global challenges that um, result from inter global interconnectedness. COVID-19 is a good example and the weakness of the World Health Organization in, in doing much about it and the, you know, the open question, what is the origin of COVID and, and, and so on. So um, climate change is another op um, topic I already mentioned um, that is on the minds of many. And today there are um, very um, rapidly developing ideas and efforts around emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, etc. And all of this finally um, actually feeds into the vision that a global authority is needed that is able to to regulate tech, to regulate tech, but also um, to curb nationalism and to bring about effective efforts in, in the field of disarmament, etc. But so that is the overall vision and of, of world federalism. And for world federalists, this is, you know, bringing about change is also about um, institutional um, innovation and in institutional reform. So the World Federalist Movement was instrumental in helping um, bring about the International Criminal Court, um, which is a big improvement and also at a very symbolic and legal level over the situation previously and generally in international law. Um, because the International Criminal Court obviously prosecutes individuals irrespective of their official position. So this does um, put into the forefront the idea that individual global citizens have rights and duties. And in this case, they are criminally responsible for the worst crimes possible um, that are under the ICC statute. So this is uh, the judicial... Um, element of bringing about global authority, in this case, the authority to stop and try individuals for the worst crimes, um, strengthening the um, power and the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice is another program in this field. Um, then, you know, Chapter 7 of the UN Charter already foresees the um, idea, includes the idea that the Security Council would have command over military forces that are um, um, made available by, by member states. This has never been realized in, in the sense of, as put, put into the ch chapter seven, but it um, alludes to the goal in, in, let's say, the executive field or the field of enforcement that the UN actually would um, have under its command its own, let's say today, that would be the better way, a, a rapid reaction force, right? A permanent um, reaction force. And now the point is that a group of world federalists globally has thought through what would be the next crucial step in a, in a global world federalist strategy, taking into consideration the work that has been done and that is ongoing, by the way, in the field of uh, um, you know, strengthening judicial institutions and strengthening the, the executive arm. And for this reason, we deliberately and very consciously um, reminded ourselves of the um, goal of developing Legit, you know, legitimate um, binding 
regulation globally and the idea of doing this through a parliamentary body. So that is when in 2002, around 2002, a group um, of organizations and people decided um, to, to work specifically on the UN Parliamentary Assembly. Um, there's a long history behind this, so um, it's not possible to say this or that single individual or group came up with it first. It's interesting um, to see if you do some historical research, um, how, you know, how many people have been dealing with it before and, and long ago from different world regions. For instance, uh, Kang Yu Wai, who was a reformer in the um, Qing dynasty already 100 years ago in China, he wrote a, a book at around 1900, which was only published posthumously, posthumously when, after he died um, in the 1930s. But that book amazingly and astonishingly actually lays out um, in very specific terms, the, the strategy, um, or let's say the understanding of the UN Parliamentary Assembly I just presented as a successive process, you know, slowly developing from a body of national parliamentarians with consultative powers and then developing into a legislative world parliament that is directly elected. So I, I didn't even know that, like, you know, um, at the beginning that Kang Yu Wai had that idea. So there it is already. And, so that is very interesting, historically speaking. Um, the idea of a global parliamentary body was also a subject at the Versailles peace negotiations, um, out of which the League of Nations uh, was born. So it, it has been a long process. And, and also, um, I think it is possible in, in to identify some, um, you know, um, lessons learned from this whole process. Um, but still, in, in terms of structural change, the point why a UN Parliamentary Assembly for us seems extremely relevant is that it would create a platform to bring about um, let, you know, legitimate um, recommendations on global policy at the beginning. It would be the most legitimate global body in existence, even more legitimate, I, I have to stress, um, than the UN General Assembly itself, right? So with the moral authority and legitimacy um, of this assembly, um, we believe that it would push governments at the current state of affairs. <clears throat> it could push governments um, towards adopting stronger and more progressive policies on all sorts of things. So. It is also crucial to say that, I mean, of course, we do have ideas what we think the Parliamentary Assembly should promote and what it should not promote. Um, however, um, our approach is quite neutral at first um, regarding policies. The, the point is that um, we believe also that um, the quality of the decision-making process that we can set up with a parliamentary assembly globally and its inclusiveness, its representativeness, um, it has an impact on the quality of the outcomes of that process, right? So we have a, an expectation really that um, the assembly would be helpful to push forward many, many projects that today lack um, support they need globally. And for civil society, civic space is shrinking. It is also difficult in the long run to sustainably um, pursue certain projects. Let's, you know, let's take one example, like the Tobin tax, international financial transaction tax. I mean, that has been around since the, the Seattle protests in 1999, right? So where are we now with this? for instance, right, 20, almost 25 years later, um, right, it has been brought up um, just now by the Kenyan president again, but it's an idea that comes and goes, and who's, who's dealing with it in a very sustainable way, I don't know, and I would say if the parliamentary assembly was in existence, it would be a body with institutional memory to push forward projects also, 
um, in the long run, right? It is very difficult, um, admittedly, um, in the global sphere to achieve, you know, quick results. So we need a platform with institutional memory. So this is also one aspect of a UN parliamentary assembly. And also the um, over time, the bonding and experience of parliamentarians in the assembly, we believe will be very helpful. One example we draw upon, although there are big differences, I might touch on a little bit, but one example we are drawing upon is the development of the European Parliament, which, um, you know, one of the differences is that it was in place from the beginning of the European communities. Um, but the European Parliament initially also had largely a consultative function, a little bit of an oversight function. Oversight and accountability is one element, of course, that the UN Parliamentary Assembly could take on also from the very beginning. Uh, that's actually something that the European Parliament has suggested. Uh, in past legislative periods, the European Parliament did support um, the creation of a UN Parliamentary Assembly, which is also an interesting connection here. Um, actually, the European Parliament in 1994 uh, was one of the global bodies, or globally one of the bodies, um, that at that time, when there was shortly a window of opportunity, put it on the agenda. Um, uh, UN is setting up a UN parliamentary assembly. Um, so the European Parliament today is is a political and, and legislative powerhouse in, in the EU, and that is not sufficiently appreciated outside Europe. Um, many don't don't realize that the European Parliament's power and influence um, is much larger than any of the most of the national parliaments, really, right? So it has developed from a body of national parliamentarians initially into a now directly elected European legislative, co-legislative body. And, and direct elections were introduced in 1979. And the, the point is also in terms of structural change that the development of the European Parliament was also always linked to the development of the European communities and later of the European Union. Um, because um, the idea of shared sovereignty in Europe, right, member states um, vesting the European communities and then the European Union with, with um, decision-making powers, um, that was, of course, linked to the democratic legitimacy that the communities and the European Union um, were able to establish through the European Parliament, right? So if we look at this example, um, it is, it is possible to imagine how a UN parliamentary assembly and its successive development is also, or could also be connected um, to a successive development of strengthening the United Nations, right? And, and other global organizations and actually empowering them also, you know, taking certain decisions. Um, and moving away, this is extremely important in terms of structural change as well, in my opinion, moving away um, international negotiations and, and many international um, decisions from the principle of consensus, which really leads to lowest common denominator solutions, because any mem single member state can spoil um, decision making by, you know, in practice, applying a veto. The, the, so the veto problem is not one only that is connected with the Security Council, which is so prominent, everybody is, I almost said, wasting their time on discussing the Security Council. Um, the, this, this practical veto power is also present everywhere in, in international negotiations. So, of course, if you are a small government, nobody might care if you drop out of, of certain treaties and agreements. Um, but for larger countries, that is a, is, a, is a big problem. And there are certain, um, you know, fields where even the weakest link can make a big difference. Let's take um, the example of biotechnology or let's say pandemic prevention, even better. Um, you know, even if a small country fails, you know, um, to be part of some effective pandemic prevention treaty, um, you, you know, if it happens to be the case that exactly there, 
a new pathogen comes up, then we have a problem, right? So there are fields where universal participation is really necessary. And, and then we have this veto problem always. So I'm getting into this because um, the European Parliament was instrumental in helping the European integration process moving towards qualified majority decision making in, in European bodies. And um, similarly, UN Parliamentary Assembly might be able to help achieve something like this globally as well. Um, well, and of course, with the perspective eventually that the idea of shared sovereignty would be um, made, you know, would be applied globally too. The big difference that um, must be um, talked about where the example has some issues is that the European integration process um, has been around, has been driven and has been around democratic countries only, right? So autocratic countries were not involved in the founding of the European communities, you know, in the first member states who did this. And, and even with the enlargement, democracy was always, of course, one of the preconditions. And we can see now what a big problem it is for a community like this if single member states um, experience democratic backsliding, you know, like in Poland and in Hungary. This is a big, big challenge to the entire idea that is behind the European integration process and the European Union. And it somewhat it, it threatens, um, you know, it's, it's very fundamental. So it is very important to figure out how the European Union can, can deal with this back democratic backsliding. And the situation globally is, of course, um, that we have many countries that are obviously autocratic, even dictatorships. And I find it hard to imagine how it is possible to come into such a close uh, relationship with them um, that involves shared sovereignty, um, because the connection with legitimacy and accountability doesn't work. And empirical studies even show that um, autocratic countries, I mean, countries with governments that are not accountable to their own people through um, effective mechanisms, constitutional mechanisms, elections, parliaments, etc., those cannot be trusted also internationally. Well, but the thing is that, um, and that was a mistake in my opinion, that in the course of the 90s and, and later, this was not taken into consideration. Economic, economic integration was puf, pushed forward strongly, whatever, um, irrespective of, of human rights considerations or anything else. So we are in a situation where we have extremely strong economic integration. COVID didn't change that, only temporarily. And we have, um, you know, a global system that does not take into consideration regime types and where democracy um, makes no difference. But it does make a difference um, if it comes to, you know, the goal of ever closer um, integration, if you want. So democratic development in the global system in this way is also very strongly connected to democratic development in nation states. So if we talk about the vision of a world parliament, to get back to that, um, of course, free and fair elections for a world parliament today are not possible in many countries. I mean, I don't need to single them out right now. We know all who they are. So, so that is strategically a problem. And that's why the European parliament, I mean, the European parliament and the European Union example has some issues here, which we need to think harder about. So finally, um, coming to an end, a few words about where are we now? As I have mentioned, the, the idea of UN Parliamentary Assembly has been around for a very long time, even before um, the creation of the UN. Of course, <laughs> before the creation of the UN, um, different terms were used, but the, the conceptual, structural, and institutional idea was, was quite similar. You know, a global body of parliamentarians that can help um, come up with and implement binding global, universally binding global regulation. And um, so I will cut this long story short um, and only talk about the immediate um, moment that we are in right now. And this concerns um, to a large part, but not exclusively, 
the UN's preparations of the September 2024 so-called UN Summit of the Future. So the background of this um, enterprise is the UN's 75th anniversary, which then happened to um, fall into the COVID period. And initially, the idea was of some that the 75th anniversary of the UN could be used as a, a point, um, a symbolic point to address the need of UN reform and transformation. Um, this, this did not happen. But what did happen was that the UN General Assembly mandated the Secretary General of the UN, Guterres, to come up with a report um, and on, on UN reform matters. And the result of that was his Our Common Agenda. The Our Common Agenda um, does recommend the Summit of the Future that was um, approved by the General Assembly. And there are lots of tracks um, that are being dealt with. There were worry worries, um, at least um, in rhetoric terms, um, by some states that the Summit of the Future and Common Agenda process somehow would distract from the SDG and Agenda 2030 process, et cetera, et cetera. But at this very moment, the, the point is that um, resolutions taken by the UN General Assembly and plans by the two co-facilitators, Germany and Namibia, includes that the Summit of the Future next year would adopt a so-called Pact for the Future at the level of... Um, heads of state and government. And the Pact of the Future has a couple of chapters that are being negotiated um, right now. Um, and there are consultations. And one of the chapters is titled a Transformation of Global Governance. So there is a little bit of an, they are, you know, they are kind of raising an expectation with this. Um, but if you look at the common, our common agenda report and what has come out of the consultation so far, there is a real reason to doubt that um, this chapter on transformation of global governance will include anything, um, anything substantial besides of rhetoric. So it is, it is really a very exciting time to, to follow this. It's, it's only less than 12 months now. And I wonder how member states and the UN and Guterres uh, will be able to avoid addressing real substantial change. And this then, of course, includes the idea of a UN parliamentary assembly um, and how parliamentarians are included in the UN's work, right? This subject has been um, neglected the, you know, many who are dealing with this uh, process, they know exactly that it's out there, um, but they have been deliberately ignoring it. So um, our campaign and many organizations that are part of it are trying to use the Summit of the Future process um, to, to promote the UN Parliamentary Assembly as a subject that should, should be, you know, discussed. And... Another interesting development at this time is that um, the UN Secretary General's so-called high-level advisory board um, on effective multilateralism suggested, amongst many things, first of all, a very important thing, that the UN should move away from consensus decision-making and towards qualified um, majority decision-making. That is very significant, as I have already uh, tried to show. And secondly, they said that the UN should um, convene an article for the review of the UN Charter according to Article 109 of the Charter, however limited to Security Council reform. Um, and of course, they have, you know, they shied away from suggesting a complete Charter review um, because it's it's very difficult, but and and also perhaps lack of imagination and political courage. I mean, let's say it how it is. Um, and um, so the thing is that by definition, a charter review cannot be limited to Security Council reform, right? So so I think this will will come back. Um, 
the recommendation of charter review. And in fact, there is an international study group that is hosted by the Global Governance Forum that has been looking into principles and proposals on charter reform this year. In September, a, a tentative um, outcome was presented and it does recommend what I just said, that Article 109 review cannot be limited to Security Council reform, um, but also they recommended the creation of a bicameral system um, composed of the UN General Assembly and the Parliamentary Assembly, while the General Assembly would, you know, keep representing states and the Parliamentary Assembly would include elected representatives in, in the sense I um, let it out at the beginning. So. Um, this is now out there, and there is a little bit of a movement developing in civil society with strong support. Um, let me mention this in conclusion. Um, Matteo, at the beginning, you also referred to the We the People's campaign. The We the People's campaign refers, obviously, to the opening words of the UN Charter, We the Peoples, and the fact that We the Peoples have no say in the UN. So... On the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the UN, um, civil society groups, Democracy Without Borders amongst them, launched this campaign to promote three specific demands, one of which was the UN, or is rather, the UN Parliamentary Assembly. There are two more, which I just mentioned shortly, namely a World Citizens Initiative, that is a subject in itself that would be worth investigation in terms of structural change as well. And the, the third one that's being supported at this time by the Wizi People's Campaign is a um, high level um, UN civil society envoy. So the summit of the future is now in the focus of many NGOs who are also trying to push um, their political ideas into the outcome document. And it would be great if the Summit of the Future would come up with something bold in terms of at least recognizing the need of investigating a parliamentary assembly. But um, we don't need to hold our breath, right? And strategically, I think the necessary change in terms of building political will will only come if democratic governments realize that the voters care about this, right? So it make, has an impact on elections. We don't need to talk about dictatorships and autocracies. In these cases, that links into the problem I mentioned before. They're, you know, they just can do what they want. Um, there is no internal accountability. And certainly they, they will not um, accept in order to manipulate and diminish the project. They will not touch ideas that are promoting an expansion of civic space and opening up the UN. So now I conclude this with um, perhaps a slide, if that is all right, on a very recent survey that was um, made by Friedrich Ebert Foundation, the Global Census. They covered all sorts of things in, in the Global Census that are interesting, like trust in the UN, etc. cetera. Um, but there was one question that is of particular interest and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation gave us the um, permission um, to use the results of one question on a world parliament that they had included in the survey. And the survey question actually asked whether respondents would support the idea of a world parliament that can adopt binding world law. And the results um, to many will be surprising. So I will show them and then we can discuss. Uh, oh yes, uh, maybe I would have to have, no, I don't need to have co-hosting.
Um, you should already do. You should already have COVID. That's correct. So, can you see this? Yes. Yes. So, like I said, the question was about whether respondents endorse or not endorse the idea of a legislative world parliament. And this study, this survey was carried out um, this summer, 2023. And you can see the results, I hope. Do you see the figures also on screen? Yeah. Yes. Right. So you will be surprised to see that in Kenya, for instance, 81% lean towards support. 81% lean towards support. I cannot, um, you know, emphasize this enough. While only 17% lean towards disapproving of the proposal and so on. You can, you can see the numbers in India. The margin is even larger, you know, of support, in term, you know, compared to um, disapproval. And um, eighty-seven percent said they approve of it. And in South Africa, also over seventy percent approved. Like in Tunisia, in Indonesia, eighty-six percent. South Korea, also a large majority leaning towards support. In all fifteen countries covered in this survey except one, the majority leans towards supporting this. So I am showing this because strategically speaking, the real, in my opinion, the real obstacle is not um, popular resistance towards the idea. The real obstacle are the governments, whether democratic or not. That is the big obstacle that we are facing. That's the government. Thank you. I am um, finished. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. And I'm looking into the round for questions. Or maybe I actually uh, just take my privilege as moderator to ask the first one, if nobody has another one. Yeah. So uh, I was just wondering, because uh, uh, there is like the interparliamentary inter union, right, that already exists in a certain form, uh, which uh, 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 I think does somewhat similar work, but it's not part of the UN, if I understand it right. Do you work together with them as well? Or is there like overlapping consensus or? Um, yes, like how? Right. So <laughs> I can comment a bit on the IPU. I mean, you, you ask whether we are collaborating with them. I yes. wish we were. I wish we were. So we were collaborating at times with speakers of parliament, right? Um, but the IPU is a different thing. The IPU is essentially staff in Geneva and New York who um, work on behalf of this umbrella organization of national parliaments. Like you rightfully pointed out, the IPU is not even a UN body. So in my assessment, the IPU is doing good work in, to, in terms of bringing together national parliaments as institutions and supporting national parliaments in building up their um, you know, expertise and resources in holding their national government accountable. But what the IPU is not doing and does not want to do, um, it is not envisioning being or becoming a UN body that would hold the UN accountable. So in reality, the IPU largely is at the receiving end of UN decisions. And then um, the IPU is expected through member parliaments to help implement UN decisions in, you know, in, in the national capitals. Um, but what we are talking about is really a UN body that is integrated into the system that can provide oversight has distinct distinctive oversight functions. And of course, in the long run, what I said, um, even co-legislative functions with the, with the um, General Assembly. And the IPU has a 115 year history of opposing the idea of a world parliament, which is very unfortunate. And it's also a paradox. Um, so you can, you can, if you dig a little bit in, in the history, you can find minutes um, black on white of IPU meetings in 1905 
when they even then even before the first world war they discussed whether they should or should not endorse a legislative world parliament and they came to the conclusion you can <laughs> you can read it they they do not support it because that would risk making the ipu um you know superfluous it would bring the ipu out of business in their perception and this position 120 years later is still the position that the administration of the IPU um, promotes. So the IPU is paradoxically one of the biggest obstacles towards global democracy today. Interesting. Do we have questions? Yes. Can I ask something? So I thought this was a, a fantastic uh, thumbnail overview of the issues. So thank you very much for that. And uh, as I see it, if you look at it sort of from a power point of view, the how uh, a, a UN parliamentary assembly would redistribute power in the world, I think there are two dimensions to that. One dimension is it would favor uh, or disfavor governments, you might say, at the expense of populations. And the other is that it would strengthen the uh, currently economically weaker countries at the expense of the economically stronger countries. So a country like the US or Germany is now exercising far more power in world affairs than its population figures would warrant. And insofar as this parliament takes hold, that of course would be uh, equalized to some extent, not fully obviously because the UN Parliamentary Assembly wouldn't be uh, the entirety of decision-making, but uh, to some extent. And so uh, that is, in, in one sense, there is an optimistic thing in this analysis. That is that the currently weaker countries uh, have a reason, even if they are autocratically organized, to support a UN Parliamentary Assembly, because it would enhance their power somewhat uh, even if they couldn't fully control uh, the delegation that goes there. So they might say, well, uh, say Nigeria or something, uh, you know, we would get a bunch of seats there and we would have a chance to influence things in favor of our country, which would tend to strengthen not just the country, but also its government and so on. And uh, one could... Uh, here, you know, exploit that in a way, or uh, one further ray of light is that if you make it a condition of sending a delegation to the UN Parliament, that that delegation be democratically constituted, that would also then lead to potentially uh, these autocratic countries gaining some experience with democratic decision making. So that could actually be a bit of a lever that could help democratize these countries. Uh, and if they are not willing to hold such elections, why well, then they cannot occupy their seats in the UN uh, Parliament. So uh, the uh, what the analysis uh, shows on the pessimistic side is that we can expect a lot of resistance from uh, the richer countries that uh, can lose potentially can lose political power and there I was wondering you know how uh, firm these uh, opinion polls are that you presented uh, the they show what people who haven't really been exposed to a big discussion of the issue uh, believe uh, it, it sounds good you know why not a parliamentary uh, assembly, why not have some democracy at the global level? It sounds like a good idea. It certainly has justice on its side. But if there were to be a big debate and if governments were to mobilize uh, arguments and, and scare tactics to tell the German people, for example, look, this is going to make us subject to all sorts of dictates from abroad. It will uh, allow the Chinese and the Nigerians to tell you what to have for breakfast and so on. Uh, we've seen that in Brexit, where such a campaign was uh, quite successful. Uh, 
And so I'm wondering uh, how you see that issue, whether you think it's it's winnable. And that gets me to my last point, which is simply uh, to say, uh, you've made out a very good case for a UN parliamentary assembly and for the potential reachability of it uh, through summit of the future and so on. And uh, why do you think this is something that people should throw their support behind at the expense of other structural change projects that they might otherwise also be engaged in. So uh, it's certainly a good idea. It's certainly uh, better than no reform. But why is this the kind of reform project that given its prospects and given its uh, the advantages, the benefits that it would bring if it succeeded, is the one that we should prioritize over others. Matteo, should I respond directly? Please. Okay. Okay. Yes. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I tend to agree with everything you said. Um, so, um, but of course, I can elaborate on a few um, details here in, in this analysis. Um, first of all, it made me recognize that I did not um, mention the allocation of seats in the parliamentary assembly in my presentation, which is, of course, uh, a key element. It, it is kind of implied, and that's probably why I didn't mention it, that it would, of course, um, be an allocation of seats that takes population size into consideration, right? Um, that is logical um, in, in, in the sense of a, of a parliamentary body. So the General Assembly, one state, one vote, and the Parliamentary Assembly would take um, population size into consideration. And um, having said that, it is true that um, the larger populated states today tend to be those that are less de economically developed. I mean, broadly speaking, still. Um, and this is changing, but it is still the case. And it is from this perspective, it is true that um, even countries that are less economically developed and that would have fewer seats, right, because they are not populous, and in my opinion, would gain um, because um, the dynamics of co political coalitions in the parliamentary assembly would be different. Right, the, the delegates from smaller countries, they could form powerful coalitions nonetheless, right? And they wouldn't be so much on their own as they are in other UN bodies. Um, and and uh, the, the key here is, of course, that in theory, at least, the governments wouldn't be those who form those coalitions, but the individual parliamentarians who are, um, in theory, supposed to be, um, you know, accountable to their constituents, their voters. You know, they cannot just do whatever they want. They will have to respond to public opinion at home and globally and their voters. So I, I really agree with this analysis. Um, um, however, small countries like Switzerland, they they still um, believe that they would be marginalized. Um, but Switzerland is rich. So this also confirms um, the analysis here. Um, that they per se are not so much interested in, in establishing such, such, such a vehicle for change. Mm -hmm. um, and um, why, um, why would, should you know, actors put their weight behind this? Um, first of all, I would say it is not an all or nothing decision, right? Of course, um, it is to be expected and, and to be encouraged that um, structural change efforts and political efforts continue to be um, made in, in many dimensions and with respect to many projects. Um, of, that's clear. And in some cases, immediate efforts for immediate solutions are necessary, like, you know, mm -hmm. curbing um, um, carbon emissions is something that we cannot uh, delay. Um, but I would m like to make the point that a little bit of energy um, of these actors should be devoted to long-term structural change like this. And, and that is a rational, um, a rational um, reason, really, because the potential effect it could have is, is huge, right, over time. Mm -hmm. If, if a, a success were achieved, you know, 
all other projects would benefit potentially because the parliamentary assembly would be a platform to enact them in in the end right so it it, it is potentially a shortcut mm -hmm. for all progressive projects yes uh we do have i i would have a, a question as well if, if you have, uh, we have uh, time for one what one more I, are you taking over then uh, after that sorry uh, so are you taking over after after for the next uh is it for I a question I or the next session no for this for a question sorry i thought okay. i don't so the please, next please, session please. yeah so sorry thank you Andreas, for this, I only caught the tail end of it, but I really uh, appreciate your work and, and this presentation. I had a question for you about the slide. Um, and so how does the survey, so when you say, for example, India, the public over, overwhelmingly supports World Parliament, how was that survey conducted? And in what language? I mean, given there's more than 300 languages in India, uh, and I would say most people probably have no idea what a World Parliament even is. You know, are we talking to the same set of sort of global elites in assessing whether or not a world parliament is going to be a meaningful reform in terms of shifting power in any dimension? And if that's the case, then are we really addressing that elitism? You know, how is that being addressed there when, um, again, and also what language would the would would, would you know would be spoken? How would we how would you address the fact that most most indigenous languages, in fact, now are are almost getting, you know, are at the sort of risk of extinction because they're not being spoken, they're not being preserved, and there's sort of movements to preserve language. And this would probably push in the other direction because we'd have to consolidate with at least two or three world languages, right, for for the global problem. So how does that how 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 do you sort of broadly represent, for example, indigenous groups whose ways of knowing and ways of experiencing are already not represented anywhere? Um, would they actually be represented in this parliament? And how did how did that survey also try to account for those communities? And I'm even thinking my 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 family in India, fairly middle class. I don't think they have any idea what a world parliament is. So who was surveyed, and how do we get a sense of like what the country as a whole would really support in terms of the public? Uh, oh yeah, I'm 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 unmuted. Yes, well, these are important questions. I mean, first of all, I would say um, I I showed the survey to imply that there is popular support, and but I wouldn't argue about whether it's twenty percent plus or minus, you know, which is a, a large um, um, number for for a statistical survey. Um, so I wouldn't too, put too much weight on on this particular opinion poll. Um, it has been carried out by YouGov, which is online based. And um, nonetheless, um, I understand that they tried to apply a mechanism to assure, rep, you know, that the results are representative of the given sample, which I think, um, I don't know, it's a little bit over 1000. And um, the, the language uh, that was used um, in carrying out the survey is important because the question actually explained what the world parliament is. The question was not, do you support a world parliament, yes or no? Um, but there, there was some elaboration how it would be structured, and there was an elaboration what it would do, um, et cetera, so that um, people who, who responded to um, the question were at the same time educated, and in my opinion, um, you know, could um, give an, uh, an informed um, response. But we can argue about opinion polls a lot. So um, I agree there might be methodological, you know, there might be issues with it. In terms of um, language, um, you said you haven't heard all of the of the presentation. I think it's important to see that we are talking about a process here, right? I can repeat what I already said. Um, so at the beginning, the UN Parliamentary Assembly would be established as a UN body, and thus language spoken there would be, first of all, the official UN languages, right? Um, so in the end, when we talk about a legislative world parliament, who knows when we come to that point? I hope soon, but we don't, you know, who knows? Um, by then, my hope would be that um, technology has advanced so massively that it is possible to have simultaneous translation of spoken word um, into all relevant languages, right? Um, and I, I think technologically, we are not too far away. I mean, speaking of years or a decade or so. 
um, which would vastly improve um, the ways of communication in such a body. Um, and admittedly, I mean, let's face it, of course, um, in the first stage, a world parliament, in a sense, um, to a large degree, would include the political elite. Um, I, I wonder, I admit that, right? It's not going to be solving all the problems here. Um, so that is, I think, clear. Um, the question is, what kind of um, system is even possible? even imaginable that is completely representative i think that is problematic and and that has been discussed for a long time in in, in democratic theory you know the, the problem of scale uh, etc um, that is something we need to face we need to face it's not going to be an ideal solution um, <laughs> but i would also say it is going to be vastly better than the status quo right it is still not a good solution but it's much better than what we have and um, in terms of representation of particular stakeholders, we have um, thought about it um, because it is also true that it, um, through the system I presented, um, it will initially not be possible to, to cover all groups, right? Especially indigenous groups that are partly very small um, and who demographically will have little opportunity to be elected um, so one way we foresee how this could be addressed, not solved, but addressed is that the UN Parliamentary Assembly, a part of the um, core group of elected representatives, would also um, include a share of seats that are dedicated to particular groups, which includes indigenous people, for instance, right? It but other groups as well, it's possible to imagine. I mean, there is a strong movement, for instance, right now about the need of including local authorities in, in global governance, you know, cities, uh, etc. So I can also imagine um, it's a different kind of group, but just to make the point that there is also a number of seats that can be taken um, by representatives of umbrella groups of local governments, which do exist. Etc. So, yeah, the bottom line is, um, I admit, it's not going to be solving all these problems, and it's not going to be solving the problem of scale and um, scaling up democracy. I don't know. I mean, uh, I think we need to be sober and, and see it how it is. Thank you. I, I would have like another question. And, um, based a little bit on what we were talking here as well the last few days uh, in the conference, uh, there were like a lot of grim views on democracy per se, uh, and on, on even like uh, parliamentarian democracies, uh, uh, suggesting that we might need um, to move in a certain extent to, uh, to citizen assemblies as a new representative tool of, of well, of uh, citizens, of, of us, the people, right? Uh, what what are your thoughts on this? And, and how is it something that it's discussed as well within uh, the UN uh, well, idea or, or not that much? Yes, I mean, there was a self-organized um, global, sorry, global citizens um, assembly um, in connection with the Glasgow climate summit negotiations and the secretary general of the UN was quick to um, support it and at least verbally you know so um, this subject um, is um, being discussed in UN circles and I believe rightfully so I believe rightfully so because um, I believe it um, sortition based sortition based um, citizens' assemblies can be a good uh, complement to existing structures and mechanisms. And if it is rightly done, and that is, of course, then the problem, the, the, the devil is in the details, right? But if it, is, if it is correctly done, and we really have an assembly that kind of, you know, is statistically and demographically representative of the world's population, that is great. Um, that would provide um, very valuable input in the political processes. 
However, um, I don't think that citizens' assemblies are a solution to the problems that democracy is facing. Um, citizens' assemblies are, in my opinion, a good deliberative tool. And they have been used in Ireland, in Australia, and elsewhere at the nation state level, which is good because if we want to apply it globally, we can learn from these examples and not pull it from thin, thin air. But if you look at democratic theory and um, if you conceptualize how legitimacy is formed and um, what is the substance, the legal substance of citizenship, the demos, um, citizens' assemblies are unable to um, address any of it. They, they are no bodies that can exercise political oversight because they are by definition temporary. Right, It is people who are pulled out of their ordinary lives uh, for a specific time span to deliberate on certain subjects. They are not people who represent specific political interests or currents that do exist. So often it is said that is a benefit, which is true in terms of deliberation, um, but it is not a benefit in terms of um, politically um, catalyzing existing um, differences in a society, right? They, they exist. There are political and economic um, interests present in a society that need to be reflected in political bodies, which are today parliaments, etc. So this is all things that, in my opinion, are um, neglected in, in thinking about citizens' assemblies. But like I say, I think they, they are an important complement, even globally. I can easily imagine that a UN Parliamentary Assembly and um, Global Citizens Assembly would um, you know, be in existence at the same time and um, complement each other in very, very good ways. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions. Otherwise, I would suggest we the last question, otherwise we can conclude this session. And uh, thank you very much for the rich insight into your work and uh, for being here with us today. And um, yes, I think that's the end of the session then. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for sharing, Matteo.